It's a big winter world out there beyond the suburbs and the beltways. Did you know that one Maryland farm lets customers make their own wreaths? That it takes special wheat to make these holiday treats? And that gingerbread cookies start with a plant that grows underground? Well, don't go anywhere. Stories about the people who grow our food, along with a local buy, are coming up next on, on Maryland, Maryland Farm, farm and, and Harvest. harvest. Major funding for Maryland Farm and Harvest is made possible in part by the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board, investing in smarter farming to support safe and affordable food, feed, and fuel, and a healthy bay. Additional funding provided by Maryland's Best. Good for you, good for Maryland. Marbidco, helping to sustain food and fiber enterprise for future generations. Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, lending support to agriculture and rural America. The Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation, promoting the importance of agriculture in our daily lives. Rural Maryland Council, a collective voice for rural Maryland. The Maryland Soybean Board and Soybean Checkoff Program, progress powered by farmers. Wegmans Food Markets, healthier, better lives through food. The Maryland Department of Agriculture, the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, and by the Maryland Nursery, Landscape, and Greenhouse Association, the Maryland Seafood Marketing Fund, the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Delmarva Poultry Industry, Incorporated, the Maryland Farm Bureau, Incorporated, the Keith Campbell Foundation for the Environment, and by Thanks for joining us. We're cozied up here at Starbright Farm in Whitehall, Maryland. I'm Joanne Clendenning. And I'm Al Spoiler. And this is the Maryland Farm and Harvest Holiday Special. We're sharing stories of how Maryland's farmers help make the season bright. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate. Well, neither can I. It's a great reminder of all the work Maryland's farmers do. So grab a cup of cocoa and settle in for a while. Coming up, a farmer grows ancient grains to make traditional foods for Hanukkah and other Jewish holidays. But first, some of the best things about the holidays are friends, food, and giving your home a festive flair. Let's take a look at how one local family works together to spread the cheer. Cheers, Cheers. Al. With the change of season, there's a new splash of color at Willow Oak Flower and Herb Farm in Anne Arundel County. While they grow a variety of plants, it's the Christmas evergreens that are the most popular during this time of year. We have different evergreens and hollies and berries for winter for arrangements and wreaths. We grow different types of boxwood, different types of hollies. We grow winter berries, which are great. Globe amaranth is a summer flower, but it dries perfect for winter wreaths. By turning this greenery into festive decorations, fourth generation farmer Heather Carr helps bring out the holiday spirit. We enjoy the warmth of the holiday season and getting to work together to make different things for the holidays is really nice. So which ones do I cut? Okay, so let's cut a longer piece what makes today extra special for Heather is having her son Silas by her side as they gather supplies to make Christmas wreaths, a family tradition. My great-grandparents bought the farm back in the 20s and they had animals and my mom started the actual nursery flower shop in 79 and we've continued it. During the holidays, Heather even teaches wreath-making classes, where participants use decorations grown here on the 40-acre farm. You just want to find things that go well together, and you kind of want to make sure you have your pieces cut the right length, and think of what you're going to put together before you start, so you kind of know where you're going to end up with your display. So that's our first bunch on our wreath. Because wreaths come in all shapes, sizes, and styles, Knowing what type you're going to make helps determine which plants to harvest. 
We make all different types of wreaths for the holiday season, full wreaths, crescent moon wreaths, all different designs, different styles. Some plants are used as fillers, others bring out the color, and then there are those that add fragrance. And Silas knows exactly what he wants his wreath to look and smell like. Silas wants to get some lavender. And I didn't think about that, but it's great in arrangements and reeds, and it smells really good, too. You just cut where the stem's glowing, with little branches. And then if this stuff is popping out, you have to cut that off, because that's dead. For Heather, every winter is a stroll down memory lane, tracing back to her own childhood. I would make wreaths with my mom when I was little to help her for a Christmas season. Heather's appreciation for plants started at an early age here on the farm. She followed her mother and would give lessons to other people as to, as to what each plant was. And she was only about five, and she knew most of the plants. So here she is today. She bought the business from her mother, and her mother has retired, and my granddaughter is running the place now with Silas. And today, surrounded by his mother and great-grandmother, Silas carries on the family tradition. I feel like he was in diapers yesterday, and I, I look at him and I can't believe how big he is. And he's taken a joy into helping. And whatever he does, it seems like it's coming pretty natural to him. What colors are you going to use? I'm just picking random colors, whatever looks nice. Those red berries look good with the white. I like that. You can continue that. That'll really look Christmassy. It's a way to share joy with family and community, not just for a season, but throughout the year. Christmas of all is one of the biggest holidays to enjoy. I mean, families, you live for, the, for Christmas almost all year round. And to be able to form something that is indicative of that holiday is a pleasure. It's time to test everybody's agricultural <laughs> expertise. Is it time for the thingamajig? Yes, it is. And this time we decided to wrap it. Oh my gosh, now, okay. no peeking. Can I give it a shake? A little one. Okay. Oh no, I think you broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it's supposed to make that noise. Okay. That's your clue. Now, stay tuned and we'll have the answer at the end of the show. Now, Al, as our resident foodie, do you know what einkorn is? No, I've never heard of it. Oh, well, keeping in the holiday spirit, it's an ancient relative of wheat that our next farmer is growing for a deep fried delicacy for Hanukkah. Oh, that sounds good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Golden brown balls of dough bob up and down in a vat of hot bubbling oil under the watchful eye of Ian Hertzmark. Right now we're making sufganiyot, which are traditional drop doughnuts. There are many different recipes, but they all have one thing in common, and that is they're fried. We fry them because we're commemorating the eight days of Hanukkah. 
a Jewish winter holiday celebrating a biblical miracle. When one day's worth of oil lasted a miraculous eight days in the temple to keep the menorah burning. Eating food fried in oil is one of the tastiest ways to celebrate. But Ian takes it a few steps further. Besides running the fryer, he also works with area farmers to grow the grain before milling it himself into flour here at Migrash Farm in Baltimore County. Back in July, he was hard at work harvesting the season's bounty in Eden. Eden, Maryland, that is. Today we're on the Eastern Shore on the farm of Aaron Cooper, Cut Fresh Organics. He is one of five farmers that I am currently working with to source Chesapeake-grown grains, organic grains. Including several ancient relatives of wheat, emmer and einkorn. The latter plays a starring role in Ian's holiday donuts. But right now, he's harvesting an heirloom wheat called red fife. Red fife, it was the common peasant wheat of the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Poles and the Gypsies. And it happens to also be the foundational genetics for most of the North American bread wheat industry. This crop is destined for use in a Jewish flatbread called matzah, eaten during the spring holiday of Passover. But first, it has to get the okay from today's important guest, Rabbi Moshe Heineman of Baltimore-based company Star K. Star K is a kosher certifying agency. And what they do is they ensure that products are in fact kosher. Meaning that they adhere to a strict set of Jewish dietary rules, even stricter during Passover. Before giving his stamp of approval, Rabbi Heinemann checks that the combine has been carefully cleaned out, the wheat properly dried down, and that no weeds find their way into the hopper. We want to get just wheat. Sure. This is kosher wheat, right? This is as kosher as it gets. Right. So therefore, we got to make sure that it should be super kosher. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay if it so doesn't make the grade, Ian can still use the grain. It is kosher for during the year. It just will not be kosher for Passover. Now, if it's kosher for Passover, it sells for a higher price because we need all this manpower. But everything looks good, meaning the wheat is ready for cleaning. We're removing chaff, we're removing stones, we are separating out weed seeds. And milling into flour on Ian's modern stone mill. It's just really a simple system. Grain into the stones, into a bin, and that's it. This particular batch is from another harvest, one not cleared by Star K for use during Passover. But no matter the end use, all of Ian's flowers are a far cry from your grocery store all-purpose white. This is a whole flower. Nothing's been separated out. Stone milling, unlike roller milling, the bran and the germ, just like the starch, is going to be pulverized into a very fine flour that has most, if not all, of its nutrients still contained within it. We stone mill our flours specifically for taste, nutrition, and baking qualities. Speaking of baking, you didn't think we forgot those donuts, did you? We're adding a mixture of einkorn flour and a higher gluten bread flour. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be spooning the thick batter into the hot oil. I came to a traditional observance through my interactions with the natural world through agriculture, and, and I think that a lot of my, my spiritual practice is very much rooted in the physical everyday of what I'm doing. Being here from the beginning and seeing it through is a very special thing for me. Especially when seeing it through means enjoying delicious fried dough. Hanukkah was every day.
coming up, Al digs up a zesty spice that's a holiday favorite. But before that, Joanne, let me ask you, what is your favorite way to decorate during the holidays? Well, I mean, of course, I love a Christmas tree, but you know, I also like poinsettias. They're really beautiful and they just add a lovely flair to things. Yeah, but did you ever wonder why we bring so many outdoor plants indoors to celebrate the holidays? Hmm, well, you know, that does seem a little strange if you think about it. But you know, there's actually a lot of history behind some of our favorite decorations, from then to now. Mistletoe over the door, poinsettias on the table, and, of course, the Christmas tree, decked out in its holiday finest. We associate these plants with the season, but they weren't always part of Maryland holiday traditions. In ancient times, Romans hung mistletoe in their doorways as part of the winter Saturnalia festival. But by the 17th century, it was a widespread Christmas decoration in Western cultures. By 1820, mistletoe had picked up its romantic reputation for prompting kisses. As a parasitic plant that grows on trees, it's hard to cultivate, but it can be harvested in the wild. Most mistletoe sold in Maryland comes from warmer areas, like Texas. Christmas trees didn't arrive in Maryland until 18th century German settlers brought the tradition to our shores. Through the years, the trees grew both in popularity and size. The spread of this holiday tradition caused concerns about deforestation leading a New Jersey farmer to start the first Christmas tree farm in 1901. The idea kept growing from there, and today, the state of Maryland alone has over 50 Christmas tree farms. Poinsettias are an even more recent addition to the Christmas lineup. Native to Central America, ancient Aztecs used them in dyes and medicines. They first came to the United States in the early 1800s, but this difficult to grow plant didn't become a holiday staple until a California nurseryman marketed it as a decoration in the 1920s. Today, poinsettias are the best-selling potted plant in North America, and Maryland nurseries grow thousands of them in carefully controlled greenhouses. So whether it's flowers, trees, or mistletoe, Maryland farmers are working hard to make every Christmas a little bit merrier. Uh-oh. I'm almost out of hot cocoa. Well, you're going to want to save some because on my latest local buy adventure, I managed to catch some gingerbread men. And I met a farmer who's growing the spice that gives them their namesake flavor. Gingerbread, ginger snaps, gingerbread men. There's a lot you can do with ginger, but where does it come from? Well, it grows underground at places like this, Two Boots Farm in Carroll County. The taste of Christmas comes early for Elisa Lane in Hampstead. The fresh ginger harvest in October is a reminder of the upcoming holidays. And she already has a destination for this classic spice. I adapted a Martha Stewart recipe for gingerbread cookies using our fresh young ginger and I caramelized the ginger and we're gonna use it, both caramelized ginger and fresh ginger into the cookie recipe. But first, Elisa needs to get down to the root of things, literally. We don't use tractors on this farm, so the way that we actually harvest ginger is we use a digging fork, and so we go around and we actually dig out each root and then pull it up with our hands. The ginger comes out intact as one piece. Technically, the large edible part is called the rhizome, or rootstock, but most just refer to it as ginger root. This is where the original root was, where it started growing, coming up and then spreading out into the soil, and then this is the part that's above ground. To grow new ginger, she plants a cutting from the mature root of another plant. So the seed, you can see it right here. This is the original root that it's growing from. This is the kind of root that you would find in the grocery store. It's just mature ginger, and it forms these eyes on it, much like a potato does. So there's these eyes, and you can see some of them are even trying to grow here. But this ginger root didn't come from a grocery store. It made its way here from Hawaii. While typically ginger is grown in tropical climates, Elisa has mastered the method of growing it locally. Every year, she plants ginger indoors in her high tunnels and greenhouses. 
But this season, she tried something different. But we decided to actually bring it outside this year. We pre-sprouted it in April and then planted it outside in May and made little, like, small greenhouses for it, basically, just uh, using plastic, like low-cover plastic. And so really give it a lot of heat in the spring. And then we took those off as soon as it started sprouting. And we're really happy with the crop that we got this year. Ginger isn't the only crop Elisa grows on her 15-acre farm. Spread over an acre and a half, there is a variety of produce and a colorful array of blooms. Today, the fragrance of the flowers is accompanied by the fresh ginger harvest. Here, give it a try. Okay, let me try this. So get it back a little ways, mm -hmm. dig deep, Yep. and then lift. Yep. Don't want to break up any of that ginger. Oh, here it comes, look at that. Just, just like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, you got a good one. Oh, See, there's a, the original root right the, there. It looks like a dolly. Okay. I know, it does. <laughs> it's amazing. Can you smell it too? Oh my gosh, <laughs> ginger ale. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> The ginger that we grow, we can only grow it in one season, so it's a young ginger, and it's a nice, fresh crop that's kind of spicy and sweet at the same time. Which makes it the perfect ingredient for an upcoming holiday treat. Well, once we finish washing these gnarly old ginger roots, we turn them into gingerbread men, which isn't all that hard. Let's take a look. Lisa, you baked up some beautiful gingerbread men. How do we get from digging up the ginger root to the oven with these little guys? The recipe is pretty simple. It's like a pretty standard cookie recipe. So you got your flour, your sugar, your butter, things like that. But what makes them really special is I put three different kinds of ginger in. So I used ground ginger from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And then I also caramelized some of our ginger here. So we added some candied oh. ginger. And then I even added some fresh ginger root. Toss it right in the batter. And then toss it right in the batter. Yeah, and you put it in the oven, these guys come yep. out. But they look a little unfinished. So now we're gonna decorate them. You got it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm having trouble with it. I'm making a huge mess and look at you, you're so good at this. Well, I'm not an artist or a baker, but I'm a farmer, but here we go. <laughs> That's it's not bad. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> And it's a special present. I even brought some back with me. So go ahead, Joanne, do the honors. Uh, you mean I actually get to try something? Oh, I hope you will. <laughs> <laughs> they look great. Did you decorate them yourself? No, no, mine look terrible. So these are the best ones. I'm going to take this one. He's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to visit us at mpt.org slash farm for all our local buy recipes. Mm. These are really good. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Now hold on. We're not done yet. Oh. It's time to open the thingamajig. Let's see what it is, Al. Okay. Oh, no wonder he's making noise. The jingle bells, look at those. They're actually antique sleigh bells. Wealthy families would attach these to their horse-drawn sleigh or buggy so that people could hear them approaching from a distance. Just like that. Yeah, <laughs> congratulations if you got it right. Tune in next week for another thingamajig along with more stories from the diverse, passionate folks working to feed and decorate our state. I'm Joanne Clendenning. And I'm Al Spoiler. Thanks for watching and happy holidays. And to all, a good night. Funding for Maryland Farm and Harvest was made possible in part by the Maryland Grain Producers Utilization Board, investing in smarter farming to support safe and affordable food, feed, and fuel, and a healthy bay. Additional funding provided by Maryland's Best. Good for you, good for Maryland. Marbidco, helping to sustain food and fiber enterprise for future generations. Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit, lending support to agriculture and rural America.
The Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation, promoting the importance of agriculture in our daily lives. Rural Maryland Council, a collective voice for rural Maryland. The Maryland Soybean Board and Soybean Checkoff Program, progress powered by farmers. Wegmans Food Markets, healthier, better lives through food. The Maryland Department of Agriculture, the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, and by the Maryland Nursery, Landscape, and Greenhouse Association, the Maryland Seafood Marketing Fund, the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Delmarva Poultry Industry, Incorporated, the Maryland Farm Bureau, Incorporated, the Keith Campbell Foundation for the Environment, and by 